Roll call. Councilperson Redmond. Here. Councilperson Clure. Here. Councilperson Collings. Here. Councilperson Stackfleth. Here. We have a quorum. Uh, there are no special presentations this evening, so we're going to start our public comment with John Delamico. John, would you swing on up here or and skip? This is not on the agenda. That's right. Right. This is not on the agenda. Well, yesterday was 9-11, the anniversary of. You may have seen many of these flags. I have three of them that I put together. I brought one with me this evening, and I'll leave it here with you. What I'm here for, what I'm here for is on the 23rd of August, I was traveling north on the Everett Memorial. I made a left-hand turn onto Ski Village, and they'd recently oiled and sealed uh, the, uh, the roadway, and it was very noisy. I was very, I was traveling very slowly because of the noise. On the other hand, I go up Cloud Avenue, and they just uh, went through the same process, and that is very quiet. Unfortunately, uh, I was, I was, con uh, I was given a red light by uh, Officer Pretty, and I have a report here which I'd like to share. I'll give it to you. However, what he indicated that is that I was going 10 to 15 miles under the fee under the, under the limit. However, I was drifting to, across the roadway. I don't believe that. This is what I received in the mail subsequent to that. So I went to the police department as soon as I received this, and I was told that it had been turned over to the DMV. I went to the DMV and they said, we can't do anything for you. So subsequent to that, I received something in the mail and indicating, indicating that I had to uh, uh, make a telephone call and I may have to uh, take my driver's test again. However, the thing that I was hoping for is an appeal to the officers uh, I've subsequently talked to Chief Gibson, but I still feel that I deserve a hearing with the police officer that wrote this ticket. Thank you very much. God bless you. Would you like this flag, Mr. Mayor? Certainly, John. Watch your step with all this. Yeah, be careful that one, John. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Watch your step. By the way, on June 22nd, I'm years Happy birthday. Happy birthday, John. Thank you very much. Ciao. Yeah. <clears throat> never know. <clears throat> uh, Todd, is there anybody else uh, on the uh, online or who would like to speak? No hands raised. If if you are attending remotely and you want to speak, please raise your hand. <clears throat> uh, 
Well, we're going to call that a draw and uh, move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, council and staff comments. Uh, Todd, do you want to start this off? <clears throat> um, you bet. So let me walk down through a couple of um, things that are working in process right now. Uh, one is uh, I was finally able to meet with the owner of One Shasta, which is the owner of the Crystal Geyser site this morning. And um, uh, the, you know, the previous rep that I was dealing with, um, he unfortunately passed away. So it was the new rep and the actual owner. So we talked about everything from uh, the need for property for the new tank on Spring Hill Road that's at the correct elevation, but it's on his property. Um, you know, nothing is finalized until the deal is sealed, but he understands the need for it, and it's the only way we'll be able to serve his property. So, I, he's, you know, he, he needs it. We need it. Um, we also uh, talked about um, the whole annexation process. He's completely on board. As soon as we can get the paperwork to him, he'll sign it. Um, and again, there are 16 APNs. Each APN has 50 plus page applications. So, and we need a planner to get that stuff in place. And finally, um, one of the presentations tonight is on enhanced infrastructure finance districts. I discussed that idea with him uh, and the potential of including that parcel along with the orchard and the landing as uh, um, a one district because you don't have to have contiguous borders. And he's very interested in it and he may actually be attending uh, remotely tonight, but he has a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and I walked him through it. So he just needs to absorb um, the massive brain dump that I dumped on him this morning. So, but it was a great meeting, very productive, and uh, very hopeful of moving forward. Um, so a couple things, just, uh, you know, these are little housekeeping things. The, uh, our fees for building inspection um, items are, are are very low. They're not in line with other cities in Siskiyou County, so I'm trying to put together a resolution and bring our rates up with other cities up here. Um, and uh, at the same time, need to renew the building inspector's contract, which will be coming. Uh, the receivership items, we um, now that the Nest and the old hospital owners uh, have actually gotten notices that they're in receivership. Um, the owner of the nest has come forward and seems genuine in wanting to do something with the property. I mean, really genuinely wants to. Uh, in talking to the city attorney, what we're going to do is we've, we've written him a letter uh, giving him one month to produce actual plans or receiverships moving forward. He's been in talks with the folks that develop the summit lofts, and I think he may be hiring them to do the work. Uh, the other property, the old hosp hospital, um, yeah, I, I think you know the owner. Uh, we're getting the same thing. I'm, I'm going to do something, but uh, we're moving ahead with receivership unless, you know, a miracle happens. But that's all in process. Um, and so I expect that we're going to see significant um, progress on those in the next couple months. May I, to the chair, can I ask a question before you move on to your next yeah. topic? Yeah. With our new code enforcement officer, are we, is there like a, a level of standard that we're going not just to these um, infamous places, but as a standard to increase the facade of all home fronts or businesses? So the, the nest and the old hospital are the two biggest complaint ones. However, they are not the first two. We've already done the uh, property on works, which is a private residence. We've already worked on the 211 High Street, which was a uh, public nuisance down on there. So this is just part of what he does. He's uh, been down on Spring Street, and any time a nuisance comes in, he follows the steps for each one of them. Uh, one of the other properties is an abandoned property down at the end of Oak Street. He's working on. 
Um, um, so this is just, these are just the two biggest ones that get the most uh, press, if you will, and the most complaints. But yes, he's got a, a procedure that he does for every single process and he is uh, actively looking for properties and responding to complaints. And so one more point on that. I, I've got a list in my office um, looking at uh, vacant properties, then um, properties that are clearly in neglect and uh, there are concerns about um, health and safety and potential infestations. And then um, moving down the list as we move on, depending on how bad it is, houses that are clearly not up to um, livable standards that are um, kind of the third tier that, and I'm just making, you know, Dan's overloaded right now. I just want to kind of feed them to him as we're going, but we've, we've got a list and we're checking it twice. Awesome. Thank you. And I think nobody's nice on that list. I, I'm, I'm they're they're sure. all they're all naughty. No okay. kidding. Kidding. Um, he has some job security, I would imagine. There's <laughs> yes, at like any city. Um, so uh, right now with police and fire consolidation RFP, uh, you know I've uh, met with everybody uh, that is on the project team. They wanted to get my input on it. They're now doing. Um, they're off doing interviews with all the people that I gave them the names and numbers for. That includes uh, city managers, uh, fire and police chiefs of other cities, our folks. And so they're just working their way through. And what they're going to do is, um, once they understand the lay of the land, is give us a, a report up front on um, where they see any potential savings and if they feel like the consolidation issue is a non-starter or it isn't going to save money, they're gonna give you the opportunity earlier on to pull the plug so you can save the rest of that money. Or if they find out that it is a go, they'll let you know what we found as a preliminary from you know, the work they do. Um, the other piece is there is federal money that's available uh, related to active transportation, um, one of our members of our community who's really active in active transportation suggested that we chase a grant. The grant, unfortunately, we can't chase because um, we don't meet the definition of a low-income community. But um, it, there is money in under that same grant for planning. And if we took that on, there's, I don't see another way that we're going to find grant funding to plan if we're gonna actually move forward with a couplet, Chestnut and Mount Shasta, um, then, other, then other this, under this program is to plan it in terms of the bump outs, all the things that need to happen. And um, if you, the council are on board with this, this is something I'd like to chase uh, um, through a, a firm that uh, works for small cities pro bono to write grants. And so we'll, we'll, I'll co-write it with them. So that, that's all I got. Thank you, Todd. Uh. Yeah, um, Todd, city manager, and I, we went to California League of Cities conference this past week. It was my first one. I can't rave enough about it. Incredibly informative. Um, I have a bunch to unpack and then I plan to bring some of the major key point ideas to our workshop next month, but it was very well done. What okay. workshop is that? Oh, we probably weren't here for that. We have a city council workshop in October. It's in the minutes, maybe. <laughs> you might have been in France. Yeah. Um, October 17th. October 17th? Yeah, that with, sounds right. Just us with us? And then open to the public, but yeah, it'll be like much like we did the at our last one. The topic is uh, continuing on with um, our major goals. Goal, goals, goals, the, goal yeah. Strategy. Got it. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, I'll send you the video. All right, bye. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm done. Okay, so through the chair. I wanted to quickly go over the water master plan. Remember that? When yeah. We, we, we talked about that in our ad hoc committee with um, the fellow from Pace, whose name I forget. Justin? Josh? Right. Josh? Justin? Same name. Yeah. So um, for the public and those sitting here and for the city manager, so the water 
master plan is a 2010 water master plan, mm -hmm. and this is 2022, so it's 12 years into this. And um, he, men he mentioned in discussing the rate change things that needed to be covered by the rate increase, such as uh, any overages to the Pine Street project that's currently going on. Likewise, the Oak Street project that seems to be, he considers that part of the 2010 master plan. That hasn't happened yet, right? No. I, I thought there was funding for that. And he made, he made it sound like funding was available for that, and so is Muriel. So hopefully that happens within a year. Um, the water tank on top of Spring Hill or near the top of Spring Hill, that will be a separate issue, but that is definitely part of the 2010 uh, master plan. And then lastly, and I'm not sure if he considered it part of the 2010 master plan, but he called it, I think, the Orm Street project, which actually is replacing many, if not all, the pipes from Orm Street down to Old McLeod, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm asking you, Todd, to um, talk with Pace and and see how everything is going with respect to the 2010 master plan. Obviously, the Pine Tree project is moving along and the, the uh, water main to the south side of town on that water tank. Um, he didn't mention, he did not mention improvements to water tank two, but it sounds like that might be an issue. And then that leads to the possibility of having to revisit rate increases as much as it may or may not, and um, it's, it's something we should discuss at a later time. It's, um, it, you know, paces of the opinion that that tank two can... Um, Be referred. Yeah. Um, what I would say, there's some interesting news on the water tank. You, you may remember that um, we entered into an agreement with the Baptist Church up on Spring Hill, and we uh, dug a test well. We put in about two or $300,000 in due diligence, and... Uh, unbeknownst to me, we'd actually bought the rights, of, you know, the ownership of that well. Um, the problem is we thought we bought it and the money's still sitting in escrow and it was just brought to my attention this week. So I'm trying to close the loop on that and, and um, you know, get this recorded, but that's ours. But in the, you know, that, that uh, well was originally supposed to serve the city and still can. But with the idea of one Shasta coming online, it's not at the elevation and the runs are too long to actually serve that, you know, Crystal Geyser one Shasta site at full build out. So, um, you know, looking at this higher elevation Spring Hill site, um, again, in the benefit of the city, uh, to the benefit of um, one Shasta, and it would go from a uh, 500,000 gallon tank to a million gallon tank and so we just need to figure out um, you know actually resizing that tank to the optimum size is really it it's expensive not but not in terms of a typical infrastructure project we're looking at like a hundred thousand dollars but you know we need to um, figure out what we're you know what we're getting the, what that worth of that land is um, and what the upgrade cost is and figure out how we if you know, if it's not a fair trade, how do we recoup that from one Shasta? Okay, one more subject. All right. Uh, so there's a um, item in the consent agenda which I which I won't ask to be pulled, but I just wanted to go over it briefly. Uh, AB 1951 is a an effort by our legislature at this point unanimously, there were people who didn't vote, but there were no no votes against 1951, which is a five-year uh, moratorium on sales taxes for manufacturers that buy manufacturing equipment. So I haven't researched it further than that. I really don't think the governor is going to veto that, regardless of how many letters he gets, frankly. Um, that's a veto-proof majority. I also think he's tilting somewhat towards the center because he has political ambitions on a national basis and he wants to be thought to be pro-business, pro-expansion, pro-jobs, so I, I just don't see him vetoing that. I'm pro the five-year moratorium to attract manufacturing to California because given choices, 
businesses are going to go to other states, and they, they are right now. Okay, so this is an effort to stop that, but interesting, the timing. We had this major decision to subsidize, this is national industrial policy, and I don't think we've had anything quite like this in non-wartime America, to essentially subsidize the capitalization, the building of microchip plants here in this country. In other words, to onshore all this microchip capacity that left, right, and is being made in other places uh, to the tune of billions of dollars. And states are going to be competing for those investments, which lead to jobs and better than average jobs typically, pay-wise. So uh, I think California wants to be in that game, and one of the things that needs to be done is a break on the sales tax for the purchase of, of equipment. So that, just my thoughts on that. Um, like I said, I'm not interested in pulling it out, even though I'm not really keen on the letter. Sorry. Um, so there you have it. If I can add to that. So um, those are great points. Um, so on the consent agenda, and again, it, choose to send it. Don't send it. Um, it's a, it's an, you know, it, I understand what they're trying to do, and I think it's a great idea. The problem, um, you know, in some people's minds in the League of California cities is, is firmly against it for smaller cities in that it will be a, a $2 billion hit statewide um, in um, revenue, uh, you know, sales tax and TUT coming into the city. Uh, that will be lost by giving this exemption for five years. Um, you know, and it's not going to really impact this, our city, because we don't have that level of manufacturing. But ultimately, that's that's the trade-off, and that that money, um, most of it is going to mental health services and um, in homeless services. So that's two billion lost in in um, fighting that. So wherever you guys stand on it, I work for you. Chief? I just wanted to give an update that we've had uh, officers on the mill fire since it started. Um, in fact, one of our vehicles is damaged in the Lincoln Heights area during the start of the fire evacuations by uh, sheriff. No injuries. Um, but they have been officers on day and night since it started. And we just resent to the mountain fire Saturday with its blowout. Um, on some good news, uh, one of our officers applied for a grant through the United States Deputy Sheriff's Association, and we were awarded a $5,000 grant, which we can apply towards a, a vehicle purchase, anything vehicle related. So uh, that's kind of a good thing. It's one of the few times that we've actually gotten a grant from the federal level. And so uh, just wanted to let you guys know that we got some money come in to do some repairs on vehicles that were are breaking down. Thank you, Chief. John? Okay. To the chair. I have the date for our workshop, if you... It, it's the 17th, 4.30 to 5.30. I think it's going to be here, if I remember correctly. Really? I think so. Monday. Oh, yeah, it is. City Manager, do we have any committee reports? So I don't. Um, the DIAC was scheduled to meet two weeks ago, and for some reason they um, canceled the meeting and wanted to put it off another month. Well, I've got one last comment because it's also about the consent agenda, but it's a different item. Right. Um, I think I know which one. Yes, I bet you do. Um, uh, we were asked to uh, consider pulling off um, the ag approval of agreement between the county of Siskiyou and the county of Mount Shasta for joint <coughs> participation in the permanent local housing allocation funding program. Well, because I wasn't here at the last meeting, 
I did not know that that was already approved in the last meeting. Mm -hmm. And all that is going to happen here at this meeting is some additional language that need to be inserted relative to some federal details that had changed? Yeah, the feds um, a week ago got in touch of, with Siskiyou Housing and said, hey, we've changed um, the resolution language slightly. And if you want to transfer this money from other communities, then you need to hurry up and pass this new version of the resolution, which is, I, you know, it's substantially the same. Um, but just as a refresher of what this does, this PLHA money, uh, it's allocated to communities. And when we have smaller communities like this, we get a fairly small pot of money that we can't do much with, and it's to fight affordable housing. So what other cities have been doing up here is um, transferring from 2019 for a five-year cycle um, their PLHA money to Wairika because they um, are using that money to build uh, in a, um, uh, you know, uh, a homeless shelter, which, uh, you know, is also where the majority of services for the homeless are, and um, so it's just it's a way to, to maximize, the, you know, the, the relatively small amount of money that is coming into uh, the you know the cities to do something meaningful. Yeah, this was discussed in in many meetings in the past. I uh, actually remember, which is you know newsworthy in itself. Um, <clears throat> and so let us move to the consent agenda. City Manager recommends approval of the following consent agenda items. All resolutions and ordinances on this agenda or added hereto shall be introduced or adopted as applicable by title only, and the full reading thereof is hereby waived. Uh, approval of the minutes, August 22nd, 2022, for the regular City Council meeting and the August 24th Special City Council meeting. Item B is the approval of disbursements. Accounts payable on August 23rd, the 30th, and September 6th, 2022 for the total gross payroll and taxes for the period ending August 21st, 2022. Uh, C is the police department report for August of 2022. D is the AB 1951 letter of opposition. And item E is the approval of the agreement between the County of Siskiyou and the, and the City of Mount Shasta for joint participation in the permanent local housing allocation funding program, uh, which is resolution CCR-22- I haven't gotten dash, the number. She's not here. Yeah. Um, TBD. TBD. Okay. So by title. Move to approve consent agenda items A through E. By title only. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, agenda item number eight is the discussion of possible action of a presentation on the Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District, which is lovingly known as an EFID. Yes. There'll, there'll be a number of these acronyms. If you're not confused now, strap in. City Manager? So I want to make sure that we have uh, Cosmont, um, you know, with us. I, I... Oh boy. <laughs> okay. Um, so a couple things in, in, um, uh, Joe, I don't want to just, you know, as an introduction, um, what we're talking about here is um, tax increment finance. Uh, it's uh, California's version. It's tax increment light uh, legislation, um, you know, coming down from the state of California, limited the entities that could be included in terms of taxation as part of an um, enhanced infrastructure finance district. And essentially what it is, is um, defining boundaries around areas that you want to develop. And the, the concept of tax increment finance in an EIFD is that if you say you've got a parcel that's been sitting for a long time and you don't say have infrastructure or you want to get development to take off at, on these sites, you um, form the district, you freeze the uh, tax rate 
on that property at the year that you form the district and over the life of that district, any increase in property tax is harvested and used for um, eligible uses like uh, development of infrastructure and a whole bunch of other things. But I don't want to go into it. Joe's the expert on this, and so I'm going to turn it over to him. Uh, City Manager, before we do that, if you'd be so kind to tolerate one kind of clarification oh, sure. that I think hopefully anyway is a good setup for this. As I was trying to understand, the EFID takes future increased property tax revenues, which of course won't be available until some distant 8, 10, 12, 14 years in the future, mm -hmm. and then uses them as collateral to go get a bond that we can use today? Um, that's, that's one mechanism, and that, that's pretty typical. Yes. Okay. That, that's You're capturing kind of a standard, in essence. standard, we go get future revenues by locking property tax at level where it is now and, and then as you build use them to guarantee over time, a bond for today. You, you need to build up a certain amount of increment so then right. you can bond against. Um, but, you know, there are other mechanisms to get at it too, but bond is the most obvious. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, please uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, members of the City Council, City Manager, thank you very much. I have a presentation available on my screen that I can either share if the sharing ability is authorized. Otherwise, I believe that it's the same document that we previously circulated among staff. I believe I see a presentation up on the screen. Do you want him to share it on the screen? Yes, please. I'd just like to confirm uh, that folks in the chamber can hear me okay? We can hear you okay. I think we're wondering if you are sharing it on your end or are you wanting our um, tech side to share it on their end? Thank you. Yes, um, it, it appears I'm not able to share, so it is perfectly okay with me if tech in the chamber will just advance the slide. I'm happy to speak to them. Okay, well, we go. we're gearing it up. There we go. So thank you, I appreciate very much the mayor's comments, by the way, on acronyms. So I will try my best to be uh, as clear and not just race through all those acronyms. We are here talking about Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District, so EISD. A little bit of background, we can advance to the next slide. We've been privileged to work with members of the city staff and the county EDC since a little less than a year ago. Uh, the focus of our work was how to use this tool that the city manager started to outline with a focus on the landing, the commerce park site. It's, while that sort of remains as a, somewhat of a central focus, we're not limiting ourselves to that portion of the city. And so we'll show some maps. Broadly speaking, the goal is to uh, set aside some funding for critical infrastructure to catalyze new development in certain parts of the city, such as the landing. It could be some of these other properties, the one Shasta properties were mentioned. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about those. So it's one tool in the toolbox. Maybe that's one of the bottom lines here. There's one tool in the toolbox that uh, has been worth evaluating and that perhaps the city council feels is continued, continuing to be worth evaluating. These districts have been employed statewide, either as city-only mechanisms, as county-only mechanisms in unincorporated areas, and then what we would call the gold standard are city and county partnerships within cities, uh, addressing infrastructure and public improvement projects that are of sort of regional and community-wide benefit that both cities and counties can benefit from. And so part of the next step is just to kind of 
uh, cut to the chase, one of the next steps, some of the feedback that we'll be seeking from the city council is authorization to do some outreach to the county to vet feasibility for partnership. As the uh, outline shows, we'll go a little bit of review. Again, lots of acronyms, so you want to explain what we're talking about. We'd like to talk in number two more specifically about Mount Shasta, the areas we've looked at. Potential targeted infrastructure, everything we'll cover is by no means set in stone. So everything from boundaries to targeted infrastructure to even the, the dollars and cents we'll get into in number four. It's just the evaluation thus far completely subject to council feedback and even feedback from potential partners, public sector or private sector. And then we'll wrap up with potential next steps. Is the city manager covered? We're not talking about any dedication of existing dollars today, uh, but forming this district would essentially freeze the value within the boundary that we define and make available any future property tax dollars from within that boundary and not necessarily all of it. Most of the time we're taking just a percentage of the future property tax generated by property within the boundary. And we're setting it aside. We often liken it to a retirement account or a college savings account for a child. We're just setting aside some piece of those dollars to make sure there's money being set aside for infrastructure and affordable housing. That's the idea. When the district terminates, on the far right here, everything goes back to normal, so to speak. All the dollars get distributed back to the general fund of all the participating entities, potentially the city and the county, just as they were before the district was created. We can probably skip two slides for, for, for sake of time. Try not to be redundant here. So just some of the specifics on the previous slide six uh, for what EIFDs are. backward if that would be okay. It's that uh, they're long-term districts, you know, they're 45 years up to, they don't have to be this long, but they're up to 45 years from the first debt issuance. We've done some of these that are 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and some that are 50 years, uh, meaning 45 years from the first debt issuance in year five. So lots of flexibility. Governance is important. Um, very importantly, if the city formed one of these districts, it wouldn't just be the same city council membership comprising the governing board, this public financing authority, or PFA board, here's another acronym. Um, if the city were to go alone, they would be five members of this board, where three are members of the city council, and two are actually members of the public appointed by the city council. In the situation where the county of Siskiyou decided to partner with the city, we generally see these maintaining a membership of five individuals. It could be more but oftentimes for ease of administration, we keep it at five members, where two are members of the city council, one is a county supervisor, one is a member of the public appointed by the city council, and one is a member of the public appointed by the county board of supervisors. Again, it can be larger, but these, just for ease of administration, have been keeping to five people. Very importantly, there's a plan that gets drafted, an infrastructure financing plan. And we've got to be pretty detailed. It's the business plan for the district. How many dollars are we expecting over what period of time? And what are we going to do with the money? So it's, it's not just sort of a blank check. It's meant to be pretty prescriptive about what the dollars will be used for. And very importantly, that plan needs to get approved not only by this new entity that gets created, the Public Financing Authority, but it would separately have to be approved by the entire city council. And if the county is a partner, it would separately have to be approved by the county board of supervisors. So multiple checks and balances, the themes that we see a lot with these tools are accountability and transparency. The approval process reflects that as well. There is actually no public vote to form this district or even to issue debt from this district in the future. When I say no public vote, I mean no vote of landowners or registered voters uh, because it's not a new tax. But there are a series of public hearings, at least four. Most of the time, it ends up as six public hearings set apart, 30 days apart from each from each other. And the purpose of those meetings is to run through the details of the plan so that everybody knows what the plan is. Presidents, landowners, elected officials, all stakeholders, they know what the plan is. And at the last public hearing, there's an opportunity to protest. So while there's no public vote, there is an opportunity for, for residents and landowners within the boundary to protest if they don't like the plan 
or just the concept of EIFD in general, whatever the case may be. And if there's a protest, the EIFD cannot be formed. The tools are enhanced infrastructure financing district. So it's a huge emphasis on infrastructure. Um, other affordable, other eligible uses of funds are shown on the following page. What you might expect, perhaps, with the, the word infrastructure, uh, water, sewer, flood control, roadway, parking, transit. You know, there are some interesting specific call-outs like child care facilities and libraries, affordable housing, broadband infrastructure, improvements to address climate change. And that includes, there are a whole bunch of subcategories there, wildfire prevention, uh, sea level rise, um, even spread of infectious diseases. Uh, it's a sort of a, somewhat of a catch-all category. And then most recently added about a year and a half ago, improvements to facilities utilized by small businesses and nonprofits. Those are among the types of things that can be paid for. So why are, on the following page, why are cities and counties authorizing these districts? Just to be short about it, it's either about return on investment or about attracting other money. Return on investment has been defined community by community, a number of different ways, just dollars and cents, general fund, net fiscal impact. Are we catalyzing more revenues net of expenditures for the general fund than would happen otherwise? Is it a positive investment? That's the most, I think, the most transparent and discreet way we, we often look at these tools, because it makes sense, dollars and cents. But beyond that, it's often about job creation, housing production, oftentimes affordable housing production, and just a way to address deficient infrastructure, deferred maintenance. So that's one way, one of the main reasons these tools are being authorized. And the second is the ability to attract other money. The most direct example is when a city is able to achieve a county partnership and sort of a county match of city dollars allocated. But it's also very much demonstrated with the ability to, to attract grant funding. And what we're seeing now, especially at the state of California level, is several grants related to housing, transit, parks and recreation, roadway, where the state is literally prioritizing grants from communities that have these districts in place because uh, the state, through its various departments, is recognizing that these districts are long-term commitments of local funding for a specific set of uses, housing and transportation. And so literally, if you have, if you look at the state grant programs for a series of, I don't want to give more acronyms, but several grants at the state level, you'll get more points on your application if you've got one of these in place. Um, I'd like to skip two slides to keep us moving. I, I, I'm not skipping over slide nine to, to short circuit anything, but I want to be very transparent. The, the message there was that it's not the only tool in the toolbox. Please do not interpret this presentation to say this is a better tool. It always takes the place of things like general obligation bonds, lease revenue bonds, um, DFDs, maybe other public finance tools that you've heard of. It's not meant to be the point of this presentation. We believe this tool can make sense and play well with other tools. We just think it has a place in the toolbox. Communities up and down the state have formed these. Uh, we've got about 21 formed throughout the state. Again, some are cities on their own, some are counties on their own. And we've got about five city-county partnerships. I believe the closest geographically is the county of Humboldt, uh, Samoa Peninsula EIFD, which we were privileged to help form earlier this year in about April uh, with a focus on uh, sort of uh, housing and industrial supportive infrastructure uh, and uh, the, the port area there, San Juan Peninsula. They're all so different. We could talk about case studies if there's time and if you're interested, but bottom line is these all tend to be targeted to the local community's needs. I'd like to go to page 12 if that's okay to talk about Chasta finally. Uh, as mentioned, we've been looking at the landing. On page 12, we have a map. Um, not just at the landing, which you'll see on the map, but also some other areas that may have some feasibility here. In our experience, it's generally easier to start more inclusive and then carve areas out uh, if there is not support. But generally what we're looking at with areas that have low assessed value today with a high degree of potential for new assessed value, that helps us achieve that ratio of positive return for the general fund. We're not putting in fully built out areas of the city into this district, but rather places that are vacant or extremely underutilized with a lot of potential so that we can afford to carve out some portion of future property tax and still achieve a positive return for the general fund from new development catalyzed by this dedication. So in total, we're at about 450 acres. 
That's about 19% of the city in terms of acreage, about 1.8% in terms of assessed value. That probably tells you a lot right there. Almost 20% of the city in terms of acreage, less than 2% in terms of assessed value, a lot of potential for assessed value growth. That's the bottom line. On page 13, again, nothing is set in stone, just some of the things that have been contemplated in our discussions with staff and the EDC is what may make sense to prioritize with this funding. Generally speaking, housing and commercial supportive infrastructure on the landing and some of these other opportunity sites. Potential water tank improvements, that's come up recently in the northern part of the city. Um, and, there's, and there's more reason behind that as we get into ways to use the funds aside from just bonds which I'd like to discuss in a moment. But generally speaking, the goal is infrastructure that actually enables and facilitates and catalyzes growth that would not otherwise happen at all or as fast or as intensely without this dedication of funding. So I'd be happy to address some of the following pages that have a lot of the detail, perhaps in Q&A, but I'd like to suffice it to say, we have to crunch a lot of numbers on these pages 14, 15, and 16 are about how much new development do we forecast, with what timing, and then out of every new dollar of property tax, how much does the city get, how much does the county get, and that actually varies a lot within the city. And, we, and as you can see, we're looking at some areas that are currently not within the city limits, and so we would have scenarios uh, sort of pre- and post-annexation, but I really did want to land at this page 16, exactly where you've taken me, which is a variety of scenarios. How many dollars are we talking about? There are a lot of factors. How big is the boundary? Who is participating, the city and or the county? And at what level? I mentioned most of the ones that we work at, a city or a county, are not dedicating all of their increment, all of their future increment within the boundary, but just some portion of it. And so 50% is a number that we see a lot. And broadly speaking, again, when you get the money or, or the value of the dollars changes over time with increment, as value builds, the more funding capacity there is. So, hey, J hey, Joe, can I can I interject for a second? Please. Um, so, I think if we can back up a step um, and talk about, you know, the potential is there to do an EIFD uh, with the city alone, um, and we're we've been talking about the idea of, of combining forces with the county and just. You know, and you may want to describe this, but you know, the idea here is, if the city formed an EIFD on its own, the the amount of time that it would take to um, harvest enough increment to actually start with infrastructure development or float, you know, float a bond for infrastructure development would be um, significant period of time because you know part of this has got to be backstopped by the city's general fund, and the idea of partnering with the county is that we're then backstopping both of our general funds, which means we can get to um, building infrastructure and other eligible uses for this, um, for this money much more quickly. So I just, I wanted to make sure that point was clear to the audience. And, and Joe, if I can jump in also, <clears throat> city manager, as to what is backstopping this EFI, yeah, yeah, well, my understanding from the correspondence from Joe is that no, it's not the general fund. It actually is the revenue stream from the EFID, and I'm, and I'm. It a is. Little so there are lots of layers in between. I'll let Joe talk about this again. He's the expert here, but you know, we still ultimately, if everything fell apart, which it doesn't, you need to have. Um, something that you're holding up um, as um, collateral collateral yeah yeah and uh, I, I guess I thought he was clear in, in his written communication that it's not the general fund that it is the revenue stream that goes into a separate pot of money and and not and our general fund was not exposed or, or the counties and Joe take it away help us solve this mi this mystery We'll, we'll talk, Joe, we'll talk you off the ledge. Um, that's a good time, perhaps, to go to slide 17, and I'll just start talking while we bring it up. The answer is most of these, the default position is no entanglement at all with general fund credit or assets. 
only the EIFD is on the line and if stuff hits the fan, your general fund is isolated. That's actually one of the key benefits that, that a lot of cities and counties have looked at this tool for is that separation. Um, there are circumstances, uh, my words will be sort of fancier structures that choose to go beyond that default setting and actually entangle the general fund and use some of the general fund's credit for the purposes of getting a better interest rate and quicker access to the funding. Uh, but those are the exception and not the norm. And so most of the time, completely separate. If stuff gets the fan, hits the fan, there's nothing but the revenue stream committed and general fund assets, general fund credit, other general fund revenues are not at all available to the EISD if it's, you know, stuff goes bad. What I do want to say, so those are all options for, for, for debt issuance. And as, as I believe the city manager adequately covered, debt issuance is one alternative, and it's, it's oftentimes the norm. But I'd like to be very transparent. When we look at these districts up and down the state, sometimes we do see numbers that are bigger than the ones that I showed uh, on the previous page 16. And in those circumstances, we often don't look immediately to bonding, and we look instead to mechanisms like described on page 18, which takes advantage of potential private sector partnership approaches. And this has been done successfully elsewhere. What that means is instead of issuing debt, there may be private sector landowner developer type who is willing to advance funding for certain types of infrastructure, water, sewer, roadway, brownfield remediation, whatever the case may be. And that private sector participant is only willing to do so with a guaranteed reimbursement mechanism. And oftentimes, this EIFD is the perfect tool to fit that role. And so in several of these EIFDs formed elsewhere within the state, there may never be a debt issuance, but it's just reimbursing what is it's a nonprofit or a private sector entity that is willing to advance the funding. They just didn't want to do it for free. They just wanted to get paid back later. And they like the EIFD. It's very performance-based. They build a project. It creates assessed value. That assessed value creates funding capacity for this tool, and they know the money will be there to reimburse them. Private sector prefers that highly to what may be the norm in the public sector, which is sort of you establish a fee program, and that developer has to wait for future sort of unidentified developers with uncertain timing to pay into that program to be reimbursed. So uh, uh, this can I interject again, and I will, I will be quiet, but to give you a really basic example, when we were using tax increment in Oregon, we had a public-private partnership in building out the south waterfront. And um, what we did is we signed an agreement with two large developers that had a couple of high-rises that wanted to go up, and they had deep pockets. And so tax increment paid for... Um, north-south infrastructure within the district and um, uh, and the uh, east-west infrastructure was borne by the developers and that way we were able to get things up online so private public partnership like that that's not, thank you city manager that's a perfect yeah. yeah just just to clarify so the idea is that the, the problem is that there's this gap between the tax increment cash flow coming in to cover whatever debt instrument you use to finance, to underwrite, to build the infrastructure needed for a project. What the guest is saying and Todd is saying is that the private developers are much more inclined to do a project where they think these basic infrastructure costs investments will be paid back. So you're basically in a partnership with a private private sector developer, probably, of uh, different types, whether it's housing or industrial parks or whatever. And and so if you set up you set up an arrangement through an EI, EIFD where that tax increment will go to them to pay back. Right. So is that clear everyone? No, it, well I think I need it dumbed down just a little bit more. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, 
The taxes on these specific lots that we are receiving have a, a baseline that go to schools and, and whatever it's... That baseline is no buildings. It's no buildings, just, It's right. just the current... Right. right. So then land. what we're saying is any, that projected increase... There's going to be a group of people, and they decide infrastructure or fire prevention or whatever to spend that money on, uh, and using that as a collateral to increase the increased tax as a collateral to base that money going out, but it's not taking away from the baseline of schools or any of that. Right. Right. Well. well right. Well, let me. Yeah. May, may I? Yeah. Let's make it specifics. I think are an yeah. actual example. The landing, the property baseline is what it is right now with nothing on it. Yeah. Right. And the reason it sat there, in addition to the brownfield issues, was there's no infrastructure, no water, sewer, roads. Right. So to get, so it's kind of like a chicken and the egg thing. Which one we got to get there first? Well, we, we got to make a commitment for the infrastructure, but we don't have the property tax money coming in from that area being built out yet, so, but we will. And so if you set up this little device called in the IFD, it says all the money from the increased property taxes over the baseline projected will dump increase. into this projected increases. We're gonna, you then go out and say, hey, bondholder, I'll, I'll use this pot of money of projected increases as collateral. You give me the bond now, we put the infrastructure in, we've got empty land, there's good, lots of analysis that says good, good, good estimates that these monies will come in. I guess my, thank you for that. I'm, I'm following up until what happens if catastrophe hits and these increases don't happen. Well, that's the idea. The, the increases would be expected because you get, you hopefully you're in a partnership well, you would have to be in a partnership with a private sector developer. So they're actually going to have the initial risk I see. of putting so in the they infrastructure cover the and collateral then the, something the value the of the land, the properties. So this includes uns unsecured property taxes too, correct? Like uh, equipment and so forth? So if a microchip plant went in at the right. landing for a billion dollars, because they're ridiculously expensive, right. um, the property tax on that would be unexpectedly high compared to the scenarios. These are very conservative scenarios that we're dealing with here. Okay. And, and so the arrangement would be, hey, we built the infrastructure, the private sector company. That tax increment um, agreement would, part of that money, enough sufficient to, to pay them back over a certain amount of time for that initial okay. infrastructure build Thank out. Thank you. I think I'm there. You know, and one last part of this, once you form an EIFD, it, it shows that the city is serious about getting these properties off the ground and that generates a lot of interest because typically when a developer is looking at a parcel that's been sitting for a very long time and they're looking at their pro formas and they realize they're going to be trying to put in their own infrastructure, they can't get a project to pencil, but then they see that an EFD, IFD has been formed and they know that some of that cost, a significant amount of that cost is going to be defrayed. Cool. John, questions? Okay, cool. You're cool. Um, John's always been excited about EIFD. can't wait to form this one. <laughs> We're going to have a party at your place. Um, it, it, this seems like a good time to open it up to the public. Um, or, do, or does Joe have more to say? Uh, I'm, I'm not, Joe, don't mean to cut you off. I, I just can't see your face. I can't see you He's going, you. what about me? I, yeah, oh, he's behind you. No. Um, <laughs> See, you're yeah, not on I, that screen. <laughs> Joe, do you have any more? I, I, I guess maybe the, the final points I'd like to cover just verbally, because I, I thank you. This is extremely engaging conversations. We don't always get this at these hearings. This is actually quite exciting and positive for me. Some of the points that I just wanted to cover is, again, this increment, it's great. A lot of it is about the increment, but it's not just about the increment. And so some of the points we reiterate throughout the remainder of our presentations is, again, even before the dollars start hitting the bank account, in parallel to any private sector conversations, it makes a lot of sense to hit 
the street on Grant and take advantage even before the dollar to the account that uh, you've now got increased priority for all sorts of grants. So I just wanted to reiterate that point. Uh, another point is that we have done some detailed analysis about what is the impact on the general fund. So it's not just creating new revenues, but let's be realistic. We are also creating new expenditures for the city. New people anywhere cost money for police, fire, community services. And so we have done detailed analysis to show what's the net net effect on the general fund. You're driving revenues, but you're also dedicating some of those into the fund, and then you've got your expenditures. And so fortunately, what we're seeing is that we're still able to, with these scenarios evaluated, to produce positive and highly positive results to the general fund in the near, mid, and long term. So that analysis has been done. It is available in some detail. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess those are the main points. There's a roadmap in here with potential next steps. We like to take it one step at a time. Um, so, you know, if it, if it is the council's desire, we'd be very happy to assist with conversations with the county on this. And um, part of our budget, just so everyone knows, through this, through this grant that's funding our work, is to not just study it, but to actually implement it, if it is your desire to do so. And so we stand ready and willing to do that at your direction. Thank you. Any further <clears throat> questions? Um, well, just to the chair, just to reiterate what, what Joe was saying, um, if you look at if you look at the presentation, um, there's a page or two about the the effect on the general fund. So, in other words, if you are developing whether it's housing, employment center, a combination of both, there's more people, more sales tax, people f visiting families, hotels, etc. So, he docu they've projected out the positive effect of, of actually doing these type of projects and setting up this type of district. So uh, it's there for you, for you to look at. Very, very positive for the general fund. Um, maybe I do have a question for you, Joe, or maybe it is Todd. Um, we have a property tax tax sharing agreement with the county that let me describe as Usery. not optimal for us. U usury? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was going to try and find some way to say it just isn't really good for us. Okay, we got three left. So <laughs> yeah. the way to get at this is this, um, and, and Joe can speak to this as well. I'm just, I'll give the, the basic Cliff Notes version, is um, if you were going to enter a tax sharing agreement on this, uh, typically what you would do is base it on the percentage of general fund um, that the city has versus the percentage uh, that the county has as a whole, and you have um, that tax sharing agreement based on that those percentages for, say, the life of the district or, like, half the life of the district, uh, you know, um, but that's something to be worked out. But that's, there, there are models out there, there are examples that um, Joe's already mentioned from other uh, partnerships out there that we can use and we can float with the county. Thank you. <clears throat> Seemed like an appropriate time to uh, open up for public comment. Uh, anybody online want to uh, get their hands up? I've got no hands. Uh, Tanya, are you gonna come up and regale us with your <laughs> insights. I simply hate to miss an opportunity. It's been so long since I've had the pleasure of being in the room with you all. Tanya Dows with the Siskiyou Economic Development Council, and I'm really happy to be here to be part of this conversation today. We've been working um, with you on economic development strategies for 20 years. <laughs> I haven't been here quite that long, close. Um, and we were part of, our team wrote this grant, a grant to the U.S. Department of Economic Development, U.S. Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration, boy, probably close to four years ago. And then, of course, you all know what has happened since. And so getting to this point, sometimes um, timing is everything. So maybe it really worked out to have you seated as council members 
and our wonderful city manager seated here too to have this conversation and this discussion. Um, just really happy that you're contemplating these tools and I'm happy to do anything I can to support you. Um, I know I have a whole team of folks virtually attending today as well um, and I'm also willing to answer any questions you might have for me. Probably none. <laughs> and if I can put a plug in for um the Siskiyou County Economic uh, you know, uh, Council, they've been um, in all these discussions and they've got some really smart folks and Quentin Gaddy and Alia. Um, and uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I think in some of these discussions, um, Siskiyou Economic Development is behind the scenes and they, you know, and I don't think it's, it's apparent to council what a role they play. And I just wanted to, um, you know, I invited Tanya here partially just so it's known that they're big players in this along with a lot of other things. So anyway. Anybody else like to speak on this? Any hands come up uh, while we were waiting? Uh, we have, uh, yeah, uh, Quentin Gaddy. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi, yes. Hey, so I think the, the big perspective I would take with this project and looking forward is, is really casting a far out look into the future of what the, what the hard needs of the city are going to be. And the thing that I can't help but think of is some of the demographic challenges that are going to be presenting not just the city of Mount Shasta, uh, but our county as a whole. We have some aging demographics. And as a result of that, we've got an excess of numerous, plenty of people who are consumers, who have money to spend. Um, but if you've been to a lot of the, the small businesses around Mount Shasta, around Siskiyou County, or really anywhere in the country, they're having a hell of a hard time staffing. And, and what results from that, you know, from, from poor service, from uh, frustrated customers, it, it creates a negative spiral and it can really have a detrimental effect to the quality of businesses. And so in economic development, we traditionally thought of housing as being upstream from, from the economic development activities themselves, but we're starting to learn on the West Coast that they're much more entangled currently. We are very much in a crisis and we need to be cognizant of future workforce needs. And I think it would be prudent for the city to consider utilizing every potential tool and get them in their toolbox, whether it be going after REIT grants or setting up an EIFD working on impact fees with developers, really all hands on deck so we can get this thing going because we want to be thinking about 20, 30 years out uh, and what the needs of the city are going to be then. Um, there are many folks who you know, will say, oh, we don't need to get bigger. Um, the problem is the share of demographics is, is going to change, so there will need to be uh, uh, some growth. Workers will have to live somewhere and um, just leaving this opportunity on the table uh, would not be the wisest, in my opinion. On top of that, I think we have the ability to sort of set a model for other rural jurisdictions throughout the state, um, not only in terms of potentially broaching a city-county partnership, but in addition to showing that, hey, you know, if it doesn't work, this is, this is you know, what kind of changes we need to make, um, things that we could take to the legislature to improve it if needed. Um, so there's all sorts of potential positive outcomes by further exploring this, and I would encourage the council uh, to take it highly into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Quentin. You know, one comment related to that, um, one interesting statistic is, I, you've heard this from me before, but with the latest census, um, they didn't look at mean, they looked at median, which is a weird um, statistical measure, but um, age of of people living in this community, and it's 57. Um, the stat that I find interesting is of retail workers and those at the lower end of the income scale, 83% of them don't live in the city of Mount Shasta because they can't afford it. Uh, many of them live in Weed, and we've just lost, I don't know how many houses there. Um, so, you know, we need affordable places if we want to continue to have people providing us the services we count on. Any 
Anybody else on the, uh, with a hand raised? No. Um, bring it back to council. Anybody have any sense about uh, what the, you'd think the people about Chasta would like on this, or do we have a hear a motion? Well, the request of st staff, um, city manager, is to is to give direction with respect to to approaching the county to discuss the issue further, right? If you're ready for that, you may. I'm ready. You know, it, it's such a big okay. issue. If you know, if you want to wait to hear from people in the community, but it's it doesn't hurt to approach, right? right. It's not like we're committing ourselves. Okay, so. Uh, like when um, I think the potential for the the the, f the fiscal potential for the city with respect to it, it really does depend on how things are developed. But I, I think things actually will be much higher. In other words, I think that the value per acre will be much higher than what was discussed by Joe. It's I think conservative. He's, I think he's being super conservative. Yeah. Um, not that he's being small-minded, but he has to be realistic. Um, it really depends on how many houses per acre, uh, what they're going off at, which we kind of have a, we know what that number is. And then in the employment center areas, and that's a planner term, but basically, light industrial, industrial commercial areas. Uh, it really does depend on what sort of investment, what sort of companies move in. Some companies are not that valuable tax-wise. So others are very valuable. Depends on the type of equipment they have in there. So a robotic bicycle making company will be much more valuable than somebody um, growing um, Cannabis, I was going to say, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, so uh, I, I just, I, I think this certainly deserves further pursuit. So I'm going to move to uh, approve, um, give direction to staff to pursue this EIF, EIFD concept with the county. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I wanted to say thank you to City Manager and Tanya and the whole EDC staff. This sounds like this might be what yeah, this, sends uh, us into some great progress for our city. Yeah. Thank and if you. I can just ask um, of Joe, um, you know, you we worked uh, or you worked on a market analysis for us, and we did some tweaking based on. Um, on the ground factors. And I can't remember whether that uh, report was updated, but if you have that updated report, can you share that with me so I can share that with council? Hopefully you heard me. I said yes, of course. Oh, there you are. Will do, city manager. Thank you. Joe, I, we're not catching you. He said he'll oh, we'll do. Yeah. Okay, thanks. My, <clears throat> Thank you. I forgot my ear horn today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, would you like to give? You kind of already gave an outside meeting report. Oh, yeah. Uh, you want to? Is there anything else to add to that? Uh, not really. Just that. There are a lot of cities that have faced or are facing our problems at a much larger scale. So some of the work that we need to have done are already in progress or are in the beginning steps of, of com completing, such as um, workforce housing. That was a major topic or, or a youth-driven um, community and planning for succession specifically with, with uh, city leadership and that sort of thing. Any future agenda items and meetings that you, anybody you want to add or delete? Anything, folks? E-scans. <laughs> um, 
So I brought up about the building fee revamp in the contract. I would say that over the next two weeks with the funeral I need to go out of town for and, um, and um, another um, personal issue, um, I'll be gone a big chunk of the, of, uh, the next two weeks or so. Um, so I'm going to be working when I can, but I'm not going to be at full steam. We'll, we'll try not to add much to that load. That's you plates. Can, you seems can to add be, it. It'll just seems to be relatively full. I, pieces falling off. You know. <laughs> um, well, thank you all very much. Uh, we're going to move to the last agenda item, which is good night.